OK, let's continue. So next thing I want to talk about is uh, antiprotons. And just to understand, so who of you have, has heard about or c could explain the leaky box model? Please, OK, one person. You, I, I will ask you to explain. <laughs> Uh, okay, good. But then I will. So the purpose of, of this is now basically to give you a bit an idea about how cosmic ray propagation works, how this is modeled, why is it possible at all to look for like a dark matter contribution, which basically is just a distortion of some cosmic ray spectrum on top of the background. So if, if we wouldn't be able to model the background at least with an effect of two, this sounds like completely impossible. And to understand why this is possible, you, I will tell you a bit about the leaky box model. But first, let's, let's start with first things. So as I said, uh, when dark matter annihilates into photons and neutrinos, that's easy because, I mean, some, some way, because they just come to us on straight lines. If it instead uh, generates charged particles, then the gyro radius of these particles in micro Gauss magnetic fields is of the order, it depends on the energy, but it's typically of the order of, of the um, astronomical units or something. So these particles would spiral around, follow magnetic field lines, and then because magnetic field lines in the galaxy have a turbulent component, they would basically start to scatter. So this can be calculated with pitch angle scattering. and uh, Ultimately, this would lead to a mostly diffuse propagation. And in fact, what one does in reality is to usually just model this with isotropic diffusion. So instead of knowing anything about the details of the magnetic field, you just assume they diffuse like in a diffusion equation. And this, this process is isotropic. But that's only one of the processes one has to think about. So if we want to discuss what's actually the background and first the signal, but then also the background component for anti-proton uh, anti searches. We first have to think about primary sources. So the primary sources for cosmic rays in the galaxies uh, in the galaxy are still not 100% proven, but it's a good working hypothesis that this comes from uh, a diffuse shock acceleration in supernova remnants, which would then accelerate protons, helium, carbon, everything uh, charged and propagate in the magnetic field in a diffuse way, but also a convective winds can play a role or reacceleration, which is something like diffusion in uh, momentum space. So particles could, could accelerate by scattering on uh, alphanvenic, uh, alphanvenic waves. Uh, then these particles, before they are actually measured at Earth, would suffer from solar modulation, which affects mostly the low energy part of the spectrum. And then there are also uh, interactions with interstellar medium and the interstellar radiation field. So in particular, electrons would lose energy by synchrotron and Bremsstrahlung and uh, inverse Compton scattering. And um, the, the nuclei would, as, as, yeah, in particular the heavier ones, would have spallation, so spallation processes play a role. I will come to that in a second, uh, which then again feeds back into what actually propagates in the galaxy and affects observations. And, and these interactions actually produce what is called secondary sources, secondary cosmic rays. Um, okay, what's interesting and important to understand why one can understand anything at all is that what matters at high energies when particles are relativistic is mostly just rigidity. Rigidity is defined as uh, the momentum of the particle divided by its, ma uh, its charge. And if, if you write uh, down uh, the equation of motion of particles in an electromagnetic field in terms of rigidity, it turns out that um, yeah, it only depends that, yeah, it only depends on rigidity, ultimately. So it, it just depends on the magnetic field. And then you have here the B field times velocity. And the velocity part still has this R0, uh, which depends on the particle mass. But in the limit where the particle is relativistic, uh, you see that the particle mass doesn't play any role anymore because this, anymore, because this term dominates. And then, um, then the propagation of all particles becomes universal. So it doesn't matter whether you have an iron nuclei or a proton. If you just look at the rigidity and if both particles are relativistic, they should propagate in exactly the same way through the galaxy. So there's a universality of cosmic ray propagation at high energies. This breaks down to the extent that 
heavier nuclei have a larger interaction cross-section and would scatter more often, so they, they suffer spallation losses more often. But ignoring that, um, we would expect cosmic rays to, to have this universal, universal propagation properties. And then, as I said, spallation plays a role. So if you have heavier nuclei, they, I mean, it's, it's drawn in the wrong way. Basically, heavy, heavy nucleus would hit an interstellar medium uh, proton, and then, uh, yeah, it would induce a spallation process that ultimately gives rise to just lighter nuclei. <coughs> spallation cross-sections are at the level of millibarn, um, and a very rough scaling is that they just scale geometrically. So the more nucleons you have, the bigger the, the cross-section. I mean, this is a very rough scaling, but, but just to give you an idea. And what's important is now that usually what happens in this spallation process, you have a tiny little interstellar medium uh, proton that is hit by a huge nucleus. So all of the kinetic energy sits in this nucleus, and this thing splits up. And what happens then is that the kinetic energy is equally distributed onto the, um, onto the, the products. The, the spallation products, so that ultimately the energy, kinetic energy, divided by uh, atomic number A or rigidity half is, is kind of conserved. So, um, yeah, if you have a spallation process, and yeah, if, if you look at a particular nucleus and then just consider the rigidity divided by the number of nucleons, if this thing splits up, then the rigidity per nucleon will be approximately conserved. Which makes, which makes, again, life much easier, because this is, again, another thing that, that simplifies, actually, uh, uh, predictions. Good. So now cosmic rays propagate, not just like this, but the, like this, and the probability. And what matters now is the column density, if you look through the Milky Way. This is plotted here. There are various contributions to the gas. I don't have time to go into details, but it's usually of the order of... Uh, yeah, 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 4 grams per cubic centimeter. So if you go uh, per uh, square centimeter. So if you go once through the entire galactic disk, this is the amount of material that you hit. And if you if you multiply this with a, a cross section, spallation cross section, the probability that something interacts, the proton proton interaction, is about 10 to minus 3. So for proton proton interactions to happen, a cosmic ray has to go through the galactic disk quite often. And interaction timescales are of the order of, of mm, hundreds of kilo years or mega years. So why does this all help? Well, um, why grammage matters? That's the story. So why, why can we say anything? So the, the main reason is that there's a distinction, as I already said, between primary cosmic rays that are accelerated in the primary sources, whatever they might be, and then the cosmic rays that are generated in the interstellar medium. And the nice thing is that there is actually a difference in the chemical composition. So this plot here, the blue line shows the composition, the chemical composition, it's basically the number density for different, uh, as a function of the atomic number, uh, of material in the solar system. And that's also thought to be the distribution of primary cosmic rays because everything is accelerated that is, that, that, that is around. And you see that there would be lots of carbon, in the, or that you expect lots of carbon in, as primary cosmic rays, but al almost no boron, simply because uh, that's not very abundant uh, in the interstellar medium, so it cannot be accelerated. However, the secondary cosmic rays don't care about what's abundant in the interstellar medium. You, you just produce anything that you can produce, and among this you have also uh, boron. So this is the, the black curve actually shows the galactic cosmic rays and they have much more boron than you would naively expect. And these are basically all spallation products. There are also spallation products contributing to uh, carbon, but this is only a tiny fraction, so it doesn't matter too much. And the nice thing is that this now helps to actually say something about, um, for instance, the grammage. So what is the grammage? You have here a supernova remnant accelerating a cosmic ray which go, would go back and forth with the galaxy through the diffusive halo and then at some point escape from the diffusion zone. And in this process it would cross the disk a number of times. So let's call this number of crossings. And as I said a bunch of slides earlier, this is universal 
uh, for, for particles with a specific rigidity. So this could be iron nucleus or carbon or boron. If it has the same rigidity, it would in principle and would start in the same direction at the same time, then it would have the same number of crossings. So you can learn something from the crossings that one particle has about the crossings that another particle has. And the total number of crossings times the thickness of the disk gives you something about the grammage. So this is the amount of material a cosmic ray encounters why, on average while it's propagating in the disk before it escapes. And that's of the order of 10 grams per uh, square centimeter. And well, how can we get to this 10 grams of square centimeter? Well, the trick is now we look at the density of the, 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 the flux of boron cosmic rays. This we know is proportional to the number of carbon cosmic rays. If you ignore everything else, all the borons would be produced by spallation of carbon. So this is proportional to each other, and it should be proportional to the production cross section of carbon goes into boron. And it should be proportional, of course, to the target material, so the, to, the, to the grammage. And we can measure the carbon flux. We can measure to a certain extent or, or calculate or fit to experimental data the, um, the production cross-section for boron from carbon. And so we, we know all, and we can measure boron. And so if you pl pl plug this together, we learn something about the grammage. I mean, there, there are some prefactors to take into account, but in this way, we learn something about the grammage of particles with a specific rigidity. So again, if a, pro if a carbon nucleus would be disrupted and spallate, produce a boron, then the boron would have the same rigidity divided by a number of nucleons as the, uh, the initial carbon uh, nucleon had. So in this way, we learn something about the grammage. So this number here. It's, it's all just conceptual, so the details of the numbers don't matter, but it's, it's about the basic idea. So in this way, one can learn some, something about the grammage, and then one can use this to predict other things. So we have now the proton flux that we measure. We have an idea what's the proton to antiproton cross-section. So proton hits proton, produces antiproton. Um, and the grammage should be the same for protons as for, for carbon, as long as everything is relativistic, right? So we can use the grammage that we measured from boron to carbon to predict the grammage relevant for antiprotons. And in this way, we get a from the measured proton flux, the production cross-section, and the grammage, a prediction for the antiproton flux. So in a nutshell, that's the reason why we can predict uh, antiprotons by looking at the boron to carbon ratio. So the entire th trick is now to measure cosmic rays as function uh, for, for different uh, atomic numbers and then just plot the number as the boron flux over carbon flux. Adjust your model that, exp that, that models how cosmic rays propagate through the disk and how they scatter to match the boron to carbon ratio. And then magically you get a prediction for um, antiprotons. And this works pretty well. Uh, um, maybe I, I, I just show you first that this works pretty well. So this is a fit to uh, boron over carbon. You can get like differences here where you don't have much data. But as soon as you have a model that fits this, you get actually pretty good prediction for antiprotons. I have a quick yeah? question. Does this imply that uh, all the secondaries are produced outside? Of, what, what about if you have uh, some? envelope something, I don't know, in this source, you would have secondaries produced in the source. That, that's true. Yeah. So this is like, like so the... So you're assuming that the sources for the, for the carbon and the, the, for the boron and antiprotons are the same or... Yeah, that's, that's that exactly the... Assumption or that's an assumption. That's an assumption. <laughs> yeah, I, I will uh, repeat. So the, the comment was... Yes, so an important assumption is here that what happens in the primary sources is that, own that, that the chemical composition of particles is not changed. Part, particles in the interstellar medium is not changed. They are just accelerated. Um, but still, you don't produce borons. What, what, what still can happen is now that there is enough target material in the supernova remnant or surrounding that you already produce a significant amount of secondary particles in this initial step. This would um, change the entire picture. So then the simple explanation and connection wouldn't work. Uh, and this are actually models that are 
also discussed and, and can be compared to data. Yeah. But I mean, th this here is the standard law. And then if, if you see something that deviates from the predictions that you get here, then th what you were saying is a possible explanation under some circumstances. Yeah. And this only applies for galactic concentrates, right? So only those... This only applies for galactic... Can you repeat the question? Yes. So this, only a, this, this is a discussion about galactic cosmic rays. So the extra galactic ones are thought to kick in at much higher energy usually. So th this is something that is only concerning galactic dynamics. Yeah? I think maybe if you could repeat just part of your explanation again. I'm wondering why the solar system, why are we using primary cosmic rays in the solar system if they're presumably produced outside? Like, why would the galactic cosmic rays take half the secondary, the secondaries where primaries would be in the solar system? When I feel like the supernovas are outside this. I feel like I'm just confused. Uh, okay, so the reason why... Good question, please. Okay. Um, so the reason why, uh, the question was, I think, why solar system abundances matter for the primary cosmic rays, right? This is simply because um, solar system abundances are tracing to a reasonable extent uh, the abundances in the interstellar medium. So this is a statement about the interstellar mediums. Boron is not just very prominent in the interstellar medium and hence also cannot be accelerated if it's not there, but it's much more prominent in uh, the cosmic rays. So that, that's that's the entire logic. Okay. So so if you measure solar system abundances, they look like this blue curve where boron doesn't play any role. If you measure cosmic ray composition, you measure much more. Now the assumption is simply that okay, maybe in the interstellar medium the distribution will be somewhat different from the solar system, but probably boron will not be abundant by five or six orders of magnitude more abundant. So and, and if there is a small difference here, this doesn't matter. This doesn't change the argument. And, and again, I, I should emphasize that this is like the easiest possible explanation of the entire story. So there are lots of caveats, but I wanted to get to the bottom of why it works at all. I mean, then there are lots of reasons and concerns and caveats to this. But, but it's use, useful to understand the, the basic picture. Um, good. Uh, then there is another aspect to this, which, is, uh, which can be very nicely understood by what is called the leaky box model. Um, but it's easier to first show this slide, actually. So now what is actually done is instead of just uh, playing with numbers, one can write down a complete model for cosmic ray propagation, which would be usually, this is the traditional way how to do it, a box along the galactic disk, which is here. You assume there's cosmic ray propagation happening inside and then free escape outside. And then cosmic rays can interact when they uh, hit interstellar medium in the disk. And then on top of diffusion, one has to take into account energy losses, spallation processes, reacceleration, convective winds, and so on. So in the end, this leads to a complicated diffusion uh, reacceleration equation with interstellar medium interactions and energy loss. I, I just flashed the equation here. Um, so you, but you can identify individual terms like diffusion. Uh, this is the reacceleration part that is like a diffusion in momentum space. And this is interaction with gas. Um, Instead of, and, and what one can then do is one can basically fiddle around with the parameters of this diffusion equation. And this includes the height of the diffusion halo. This includes uh, the energy dependence of the diffusion constant, the normalization of the diffusion constant, and a bunch of other parameters. Try to reproduce the boron to carbon ratio. And then predict what you see in antiprotons. And Traditionally, this worked quite well. So this is comparison with PEMLA data. And this works usually especially well, or is thought to work well at high energies where you have this universality in the propagation because only rigidity matters. Um, OK, to understand now a bit more what one can actually learn. So right now, look. Right, so one, one interesting aspect is now, what, what can one actually learn from the slope here? So the boron to carbon ratio. Because the slope that you see here tells you something about the uh, diffusion constant. And I, I will just guide you through this leaky box model, and then we go back to the full example. So now let's consider again an extremely simple scenario. So just a box, OK? Box with number of particles inside. There's a source term. This is just the number of particles produced per time. And then there is an escape term. Uh, so this is the number of particles in the box. And this is the lifetime of these particles, or the escape time. 
and that's a leaky box because they can leak out the particles and we can connect this to diffusion parameters as follows. So this here would be uh, if you have a diffusion process with a diffusion constant d, just a constant with the correct units and some time t tau where the particles diffuse, they have diffused on average a distance x. So it's, it's just given by this expression. So they diffuse in a, uh, in the, with the square root of time basically. And then we can identify x with the extent of the box. So let's say the box has a height l and width and, and depth l. So we can identify l with, a si with this diffusion length and say, okay, the particle escaped when it hits the boundary on average. So the es implied escape time is something like box uh, le uh, uh, yeah, size squared divided by diffusion constant. And then we plug this in here. Right, we can do this. And we plug a few other things in. First, source spectrum. So now we assume that the source actually, so this is th that this is actually an equation that depends on energy. Energy losses don't play a role. So the only thing that plays a role is that the equation has different solutions for different energies. Or in this case, for different rigidities. So we assume the source spectrum is somehow proportional to rigidity to the power minus gamma. So it's just a power law that the few diffusion parameter is also a power law. So this is a diffusion, uh, just a constant prefactor and then something that grows with, uh, with energy or with, with um, rigidity. And then we can just plug this in here and solve for steady state. So set this to zero and then just like uh, move around some numbers and then we get the steady state solution. So the primary cosmic ray flux will depend on L squared divided by D times and, and will have the spectrum. So this, it will have the spectrum of the initial sources modified by the energy dependence of the diffusion constant. So, and, and that's not a surprise because if higher energetic particles diffuse faster, they are lost faster, they escape faster, so you would expect to see less of them in the primary cosmic rays. Uh, furthermore, if the box is larger, they will stay longer in, so you would expect more. And if the diffusion constant is larger, again, they can, so if, if the um, constant is larger, the prefactor, again, they can escape faster, so you expect less cos primary cosmic rays. So that's now a spectrum, uh, statement about the spectrum of the primary cosmic rays that doesn't help you much if you don't know gamma. But now what you can do is actually also look at secondaries. So the spectrum, the, the source for secondaries would be proportional to the primary cosmic rays, right? Because you need primaries to, to generate secondaries, divided by L, because we have, have this box uh, and the probability that it, uh, the particles, the primary part, or the fraction of primary particles that would be in a disk-like intersection in the, box, uh, in the box compared to the probability to be anywhere else is basically L. So that's the the, the source term of secondaries. And then we can just plug this in again, do the same calculation, and we end up with this here. So this is now the number density of secondaries. And you see that we started now with this spectrum and diffusion kicked in a second time. So now actually the spectrum depends on the source spectrum and then twice the diffusion effect. And if you now just write secondary divided by primary ratio, what disappears is the injection spectrum so the primary spectrum doesn't matter, but what matters still is the effect of the diffusion. So secondary to primary ratio becomes proportional to rigidity to the power minus uh, energy dependence or rigidity dependence of the diffusion parameter. And on top of that, we see that the normalization actually depends not only on L or D, but on both, on the ratio. So by measuring secondary to primary ratio, what one can measure is the slope of the diffusion parameter and this funny combination of um, the diffusion zone height, basically, and the diffusion constant. Quick question. Yep. Can, sorry, because I think it's very simple. The diffusion, are we diffusing through this magnetic field or diffusing through other quantum particles? Um, so the question was wh where the diffusion happens. So the diffusion. Uh, blah, 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 blah happens basically in this imaginary box. So the idea is that there is a region around the galactic disk where the magnetic field is still turbulent and their diffusion happens. And then at some point this stops. So at some point particles can 
escape freely. But so it's diffusing through, through a magnetic field. It's diffusing through a magnetic field, yeah. Okay. So when, when there's a factor of six yeah. in the equation, that, I mean, that sounds like maybe translation to the rotation that sounds like some trouble, <coughs> but you're moving through. I think this factor of six, if I remember correctly, just comes from the fact that this is a 3D thing and how you define the diffusion constant. Um, so you could also absorb it. Um, okay, so questions about this. I mean, it, it's a very simple, nice story. If, if you have to think about the indices and, and powers, again, that it's worth it because like, this explains you already a lot, well, it tells you a lot about what you can easily measure and what you can't easily measure in cosmic rays. But okay, the story is now we have boron to carbon. This tells us something about the slope and this ratio. But in particular, it doesn't tell us anything about the height of the diffusion zone. So the height can be like tiny in principle, or it can be huge. Um, and on top of that, we get the nice prediction for antiprotons. So one problem is now that the signal flux actually of dark matter wouldn't be that well constrained for the very reason that the diffusion zone height is not constrained. But dark matter is not just produced in the inner part of the disk, but it would be produced in a halo. So it would be produced anywhere within the diffusion zone. And somehow the, dif the region in which particles would produce is basic, would diffuse is the region where these dark matter annihilation products would be captured. So the larger the diffusion zone, the larger the expected flux. And a long time, it was not really clear what are the limits on the diffusion zone. There are now more and more reasons to believe that it goes up quite high. But yeah, if you, if you wanted to have a very thin diffusion zone, 0.5 kiloparsec, the flux would have been very low. So that, that's just to illustrate that fluxes can depend on the... Uh, signal fluxes are much more sensitive to propagation details than actual background fluxes. Okay. So now AMS released their measurements in April 2015 of the anti-proton to proton ratio. And they had this impressive picture where they showed that they have a gigantic excess above like the expected background. Fortunately, colleagues were very fast in uh, correcting this to a certain extent. So this was a paper that was literally on the day on the, on the next, next morning, was, was in the archive. Um, where they show, okay, if you fit, includes various uncertainties in the predictions for the backgrounds, like cross-section uncertainties, propagation uncertainties, propaga uncertainties in the primary slopes, and solar modulation, which plays a role at low energies, then actually the excess is probably not that big in the first place. Um, it's still obviously harder than what one would have expected naively, if one fits boron to carbon, but uh, it's not clear whether you should call this uh, necessarily an excess. Um, I, I will come to that a bit later uh, more, but I want to, to go fast through this. There were also some discussions that maybe there is nothing at high energies. It, there are quite some details about how to fit the data. So sometimes you can include boron to carbon, other people don't include boron to carbon in their fits and so on and so forth. So this group here only fitted uh, light particles and they found last year, I think this was or two years ago, that there might be an excess actually in this turnaround region. So like at one, at, at 10 GeV, you, it's, it's hot, yeah, you, you, you wouldn't see it. So it's, it's like a two couple of, maybe 5% contribution to the, um, to the fluxes that what sees here in this turnaround. And this actually has stuck. So there are not, were quite a few papers that found a similar excess in the emission, I mean excess, because it's really hard to identify. It's a very, very tiny residual that you see on top of a function that curves exactly where you see the excess. Um, Nevertheless, the fun thing was that if one fits this, if one sa says, okay, there is a dark matter contribution, then actually the best fit values that one gets for this are around 80 GeV or something and annihilation cross-section consistent with thermal annihilation, which happens to be also pretty consistent with what you need to explain the from GeV excess and gamma ray data. So this, this made it certainly interesting. Um, yeah, I could go into more details, but the one thing I want to say here is there have been various uh, analysis afterwards. The nicest probably is from Reinhard and Winkler later last, la late last year. They basically uh, analyzed the data again, but taking into account a large number of uncertainties by so, yeah, uncertainties in the nuclear spallation data for, for boron production. So actually they refitted experimental data. This is here experimental data. This is their fit. You see various other curves that have been used, extrapolation curves, 
in the literature. And they, they derived the covariance matrix for this. They derived the covariance matrix for solar modulation, for the cosmic rays that are, are measured, and, and so on and so forth, and refitted the data and found that then you can actually explain boron to carbon and proton to, um, the anti-proton flux reasonably well with these two models, which look w with this one model, which doesn't look like it goes through all the data points very nicely, right? But it still gives a good fit to the data for the simple reason that what these guys included is actually the covariance of the uh, errors. So um, this, this band here just shows the one sigma uncertainty, but the entire curve can, can, can move to, to accommodate the data and apparently it works. So apparently they have a reason model. But you see that there are correlated residuals and they found, yes, if you put a dark matter signal in, in this range here, it improves the fit, but only by one or two sigma. So taking into account correlated uncertainties is hard, obviously, but it's uh, probably the thing one has to do in the future for, for any kind of cosmic ray analysis. On top of that, one should also include uh, correlated uncertainties for the experimental uncertainties, which nobody really knows. So that, that will remain a caveat. What's nice with this anti-proton story is, however, that one can, in principle, get limits that are stronger than the dwarf limits. So you do get this hint for a signal in this re regime here. This is still from the Winkler paper. But you also get everywhere else pretty strong limits um, that happen to be stronger than the limits from Fermi dwarfs, as you can see here, everywhere. Um, and this is not something they only found, but basically every uh, recent analysis found based on, on, on AMS data. What's still a bit disconcerting is that the limits seem to be uh, sometimes much stronger than the expected limits, so that's a bit hard to, to make sense of. Um, but yeah, I think if one, if one wants to talk about getting limits strong, stronger faster than probably doing it with antiprotons uh, is, is better than doing it uh, or easier than with dwarfs in the midterm future, simply because the data is already there, it seems to be very strong. One just has to, to make a convincing analysis that keeps all the systematics, uh, systematics in check. So that's antiprotons. Uh, questions? Otherwise, yep. Um, in the uh, slide number uh, 49, why uh, data from Amela and MS disagree on flow energies? Uh, yes, I will. So very good question is, why does data between different experiments disagree and nobody? I mean, usually in talks like this, this is completely glanced over. And the reason it's, it's a time-dependent effect. So this is solar modulation. Uh, so ba basically what happens is solar, uh, the sun has a, has a solar wind. Uh, so basically these are charged particles that are blown out in some complicated, um, in some po complicated magnetic configuration. And uh, the particles, to re cosmic rays have to, to reach Earth while going through the solar wind. So the, li the, the less energy they already have from the start, the more, uh, is the more relevant is this effect. And so this effect usually starts to, to matter, apparently, for energy around 10 GeV. I mean, this, this is what, what is observed in the data. And it's, it's a time-dependent effect. So it depends on the strength of the solar wind. And also the, solar, the sun has a cycle of 11 years or so where it flips polarity. And to a certain degree, it's also a, a, char a charge-dependent effect. So there are differences, but there are also now quite, quite a few nice papers where, where this is a bit analyzed in more detail. And, and for instance, this charge-dependent effects are taken into account in this Winkler analysis. Um, so th that, that's the reason why, why there is a difference between, um, yeah, between different measurements. But usually there will be, for instance, if you would, I, I'm not talking about this here, but if you look at the positron, uh, flux that is measured and compare this with theoretical predictions also usually there is a I mean this is different at high energies and at low energies at low energies because of solar modulation and at high energies because of uh, probably additional primary sources or additional primary sources most likely does that mean that Pamela and AMS2 or they're in different I don't know anything about these I, th this is mostly because of different measurement times so the AMS data was taken to I mean, until recently, but I think the, these data points are probably between 2014 and 16 or something. And so Pamela data was, was before, and so th this is affected differently. 
More questions? Otherwise, I will go on with the Fermi GV access. So, who has heard, who has not heard about the Fermi GV access? <laughs> it's not an embarrassing question. It's supposed to be embarrassing. I guess everybody has heard about it because it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but probably we all. I, I, I would. Things about yes. Yeah, yeah. So the basic idea is, <laughs> if you look, if you take Fermi data, look at the galactic center, make something complicated, you find the access at that peaks around 2 GeV or something that happens to look like a dark matter signal. So that's pretty cool because, of course, we would like to find dark matter signals. And it's probably, from my perspective, since I'm working on this stuff, uh, the m most... Com I mean, it, if, if you want to have something that looks like a dark matter signal, or if you want a dark matter signal, that, that's like the vanilla thing you are looking for. That doesn't mean it's, it's a dark matter signal, and, and I, have, I, I will explain this a bit more. But it could have been, and it would have been a nice one, anyway. And it, we still don't know. So this is a literature overview, just the papers that looked at data. There are like hundreds of papers that built models for this. You see the green ones are all about like it's m dark matter, most likely, then excess is there, is the yellow ones, the black ones are it's probably not there, and the red one, no, the, the excess is likely not dark matter, are the black ones, and the red ones are, okay, actually it's not there in the first place, so what are you talking about? And you see the green ones are all with Dan Hooper. He's, he was a huge <laughs> advocate. But uh, I, I, the point is, I think the entire story wouldn't have started without him. So it, it looks like this excess is there. It's an interesting thing to understand what's going on. And he's the guy who pointed to it. So uh, all the credit to him. Um, but yeah, we, we simply have to figure out what, what's going on there. And it, it looks pretty cool. So uh, good. there were ma many papers. I will talk, mostly talk about my own. But, but, okay, emission profile. This is what people tend to agree on to a certain extent. So there's, if, if you measure the excess emission, so I, I should say what's the spectrum. So the spectrum is compatible to a certain extent with dark matter annihilation with masses around 50, 60, 70 GeV or something into BB bar. And it has a profile that seems to be a bit steeper than what you get from, so, so a bit steeper than, than just the NFW. So this year's comparison with actually Eagle simulations, so embody simulation results. And the profile was measured by various groups. We made this, this, uh, these regions here, the green ones, uh, other groups around Tracy Slatier, and, and also Dan found similar error bars. So this excess emission seems to be something that peaks towards the center and then goes up to 10 degrees, probably even higher. Um, although it becomes increasingly hard and more disc like uh, mixed with the Fermi bubbles at very high latitudes. But the sweet spot where you can say something about the excess is basically a couple degrees away from the galactic disk or center, because there the gas emission does play a less role in the Fermi bubbles, at least if you assume they are flat. So I should say the Fermi bubbles are huge extended bubble-like features around, below and above the galactic plane, which are very hard to model. So they are always a concern in this game. Uh, but one can hope that they maybe don't play a ma major role in this inner part here and, and don't affect much the excess discussion. Okay, so these are best fit values for, for the Fermi GEV access, and the black curve is uh, the dwarf upper limits, which seems to exclude most of these um, measurements. But there are still, for, for the galactic center access, there's probably a f uh, wiggle room of a factor of five or four or whatever. So maybe we underestimate the dark matter density there. So this, this would move down, and the dwarf limits also have some uncertainty. So th this is not a killer argument. Um, but, but it certainly would have been nice if it is were a dark matter signal, if it would have shown up in the dwarfs. So what I want to talk about a bit is how, how these analysis techniques actually work. How, so how to get the dark matter signal or dark matter-like signals out of the data. So what you usually do is you start, obviously, with the data. So this here would be the galactic disk, the galactic center, and the rest. And then you try to model it with the various components that play a role. One is inverse Compton emission. I already, already mentioned this. So this is produced by cosmic ray electrons scattering on starlight or, uh, cosm or the CMB or uh, dust emission, thermal dust emission. Then there is emission, and this is basically tracing uh, the interstellar radiation field to a certain extent and the distribution of cosmic ray electrons. So it looks pretty smooth. Then neutral, then, then there is cosmic ray interaction, so mostly proton-proton and proton-helium. Uh, and 
yeah, proton neutron interactions. So this would be a neutral, um, and, and th this produces neutral pions, which give rise to, to photons. There's also Bremsstrahlung that plays a role. This would be uh, elect uh, electrons scattering on the interstellar medium. And this traces the interstellar medium. So this would be this, this cloud-like structure. Ba basically, what you see here is the distribution of gas. And on top of that, there are a couple of thousand point sources and maybe some dark matter signal. And then you try to fit it to the data. And usually how this is done, not always, but often, is to take like spatial templates for these things. So one or multiple maps that have like the shape of gas emission, one or multiple maps that look like inverse Compton, and then lots of point sources. Ideally, you just mask them, uh, plus some dark matter thing, and then you fit it to the data. And so this, and, but you do it energy bin by energy bin. So you can split up the F entire problem uh, in, in, in like 30 whatever energy bins, a few dozen energy bins between 1 GeV or 0.1 GeV and 100 GeV and repeat this fitting procedure. And so this leaves, leads to a number of free parameters that is basically the number of energy bins that you have and the number of components. So this is called template fitting. Uh, so for the neutral pile and the numerous yeah. templates, are they based on data or simulation? Uh, no, 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 there's no, s so the question was where, where the templates actually come from. I, I will s uh, talk about this on the next slide, so, yeah. So, do, you, do people usually do this in the inverse way, where they try to fit models to the data, or do, does anyone do it in the, where they forward model the gamma ray spectrum? So they... <laughs> in a certain extent, this is like a bastardized, whatever version of, okay, the, the question was, and I, I will come to this in a second as well. Whether people do forward modeling in the sense of, instead of just starting with templates and then introducing lots of parameters to, f to fit them to the data, you start with assumptions about cosmic ray injection and whatever, I guess, and then fit this to the data. This is what should be probably done, but nobody has done it in this complete way because it's like a crazy amount of work. Uh, yeah, but it's... Yeah, so usually, actually, one, one does this in multiple steps up to now. And I, yeah, I will go big in details uh, wh where these multiple steps come from. So to generate the maps, actually, what one does usually is to, to assume some injection, so distribution of cosmic ray sources in the galaxy. Uh, what everybody basically did up until a couple of years ago was to just not add anything at the galactic center. There's 10% star formation happening there, or less, but up to 10%. Uh, but usually this was not included simply because Galprop, I guess, didn't include it and Galprop didn't include it because they were originally only interested in local cosmic rays. So they didn't need this. Anyway, so usually actually there is n a void in the inner galaxy. So there is n not a, yeah, so there's just nothing really happening in the inner galaxy in, in, the, in these analysis. Uh, and then you propagate the cosmic rays with propagation codes that calculates their interaction with the interstellar medium and energy losses and everything. Then you get predictions for how the gas emission would look like, how inverse Compton would look like. This is based, the, the gas templates are based on measurements of 21 centimeter line and so CO line, which traces molecular gas. And this gives predictions for, for the various spatial morphologies, which you can then put back here into this model. Uh, there are lots of caveats to that. Um, but I will come to this in a second. So what, what you need for this is obviously the gas maps, and you also need a model for the interstellar radiation field, um, which, which is available. Good. So what, what then all these analysis, well, many analysis found is that there is this extra component in the inner galaxy. But as I said, usually, actually, this extra component is identified above models that inject don't have anything happening in the galactic center. So if one talks about GEV access, it's not so much an access above like a very good model for the galactic center emission, because there is no very good model for the galactic center emission. But it's if everything works right, just the galactic center or bulge emission itself. OK, so that, that's kind of an important point. What actually all these analyses, not all, but what many of the analyses do is subtract foreground. So you subtract the galactic disk. You subtract anything along the line of sight. But many of the analyses didn't include anything for the inner one or two kiloparsec. This changes now, and, and um, there are lots of debates. But 
traditionally the GV excess is like the galactic center emission or the bulge emission, not an excess necessarily. Okay, so what could constitute the excess. The first thing is star formation. As I said, usually this was ignored. This changed now a bit, but uh, so the, the point is if one talks about the GV excess, that has a luminosity of around 10 to the 37 ergs per second. So that's the luminosity. Um, and if you now think about star formation, one every 100 years a supernova goes off, 10% of that happens in the galactic center, 10% of the energy goes into cosmic rays, and 1% of the energy that goes into cosmic rays goes into leptons, then this gives us one to the, uh, yeah, 10 to the 37 ergs per second, which is exactly what we need to explain the emission of the GV excess in terms of, of just energy, so just calorimetric arguments. However, it's not so easy to ch channel all this energy in inverse Compton emission that looks like a GEV excess. So this was done by several people. Usually what simply happens is, yes, you can explain the GEV excess, but not the spectrum. So you start okay, ex absorbing the GEV excess and then over subtracting stuff at low energy. So the problem is, the I should have put a spectrum for the GEV. The GEV excess like has a spectrum like this, something, and stuff from and inverse Compton usually just looks much softer at low energy. So if you try to explain the GEV excess here, you over subtract here. And that's a universal property of everything I've seen that people did with star formation up to now. There might be ways around, but, but it's, it's not easy. So you usually get the spectrum wrong. Then there might be bubble-related emission, so emission to these Fermi bubbles, but who knows? Um, then again, the question would be, how does it produce something like the GEV excess? There might be young pulsars that could contribute or millisecond pulsars, and then we'll come to this in a second. And then on a speculative side, dark matter, obviously, which um, seems to work very well. Um, so, yeah. so dark matter, as I said, ex explains the excess. What's remarkable with the excess, and I deleted these slides, but what, what's interesting is if one looks at different regions uh, around the center region of the galaxy, the spectrum of this excess emission seems to be very similar. Um, so it, you, you get to peak at a couple of GeV. So this suggests th th this is compatible with dark matter annihilation because you would expect to see the same spectrum everywhere. It's also compatible with large number of unresolved sources that on average look the same in different regions of the sky. It's not so much compatible with uh, inverse Compton emission because energy losses actually would induce diff would produce different spectra at different distances from the galactic center. So this is why, why I find inverse Compton related uh, explanations not very compelling. Although inverse Compton emission related to star formation should play a role, but probably not the role of explaining the GED excess. So millisecond pulsars, why are they interesting? Well, for, first, how, how could, to explain the GED excess with millisecond pulsars, one needs a couple of thousand of them at least. How do they get in the bulge? Well, there, there's one idea which is Okay, how to produce millisecond pulsars? First, you need pulsar in a binary system that then starts accreting material from the companion star to spin up, and then you get a millisecond pulsar in the, in the best case. So you need dense enough stellar systems to have enough binary systems to make this happen. Well, at least that's, that's not necessary. Necess yeah. And how do you make the pulsar in the <coughs> Ah, the pulsar might be just a remnant after a supernova explosion. Yeah. Okay. So you do not necessarily need dense stellar systems for this, but, but it can help. So one idea was uh, globular clusters, which are very dense stellar systems, and they are known to harbor lots of millisecond pulsars. So we see globular clusters, and there is this effect that globular clusters are disrupted by tidal forces, and then the debris is dis redistributed in the inner galaxy. And it happens to be redistributed in a way, at least this is according to one model in one paper, uh, that matches pretty well the, the morphology of the GEV axis. So one could imagine that millisecond pulsars are produced in globular clusters. They are disrupted and the debris is redistributed in the inner galaxy. And millisecond pulsars can live billions of years in principle. And this would be one way how to. Do you, do you need accretion always to generate a millisecond to speed up? Yes, you need the accretion of material. Always. So, you, so they have to be born in a binary? Yes. Ah, okay. They so always have to be born in a binary? Yeah, so millisecond pulsars are always born in, in binary systems. Because, because you need the... Yeah, uh, uh, regular pulsars have... I don't have the plot here, but I mean, their uh, rotation 
frequency goes down to seconds or m maybe below seconds, 0.1 seconds or whatever, but you don't get down to milliseconds. So, so milliseconds is only the <coughs> Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. But they are surprisingly common. So Fermi found m many more than they initially expected in gamma rays, for instance. But uh, you don't see them far away, right? You, yeah, I come to this in a second. So you don't see them far away up to now. That's true. But um, yeah, I will discuss this a bit later. So, so all this thing about this is just uh, speculation. <laughs> yes, but it's it's I think promising speculation, and I will come to I will explain how but to. Is it good speculation or is just? It's speculation a testable model, and we will test it very soon. And I think it's the best explanation. And I I would bet some money on it's right, but uh, that's maybe wrong anyway. Well, but I, I it's testable, and I will explain in a second half. <laughs> I, I bet a lot of time on it. Uh, yes, <laughs> I don't know how much my time is worth, but I mean, it's <laughs> anyway. So an observational challenge, right? On the on the gamma ray side, actually, the problem is that dark matter would pr look pretty much like points. Yeah, dark matter would look like this with no sound noise on top of that, where as if it's point sources, it would look like more speckled. And to say whether it's this or that, one basically has to find non-Poissonian peaks on top of, of Poisson noise. The problem is that if it's millisecond pulsars, then even the brightest ones would be just bright enough to be detected by Fermi. So that's hard. Uh, so what we did a couple of years ago, I'll just go quickly over this, is just taking the data and then use like a wavelet analysis to pick out wannabe point sources at the three, four sigma level, and then one can do a Monte Carlo. So these are the wannabe point sources. Some of them are real point sources identified by Fermi, but there's also lots of noise, and then some might be actually millisecond pulsars that, that are not bright enough to make it into the per, uh, Fermi point source catalog. But one can just Monte Carlo how many of these peaks one would see if there are no millisecond pulsars and how many one would see if there are millisecond pulsars. And it turned out that we first had a quite significant detection, so deviation basically from what you would expect just from Poisson noise, and that the best fit values that we had for the density of these sources and for the maximum luminosities that these sources have agrees pretty well with what one would expect uh, from millisecond pulsars explaining 100% of the, of the GEV excess. So basically, we, what we did is we counted the number of peaks, 1 sigma, 2 sigma, 3 sigma, 4 sigma, 5 sigma peaks, and compared it with a simple model where we have the number of millisecond pulsars free and the luminosity function with a fixed slope and a hard cutoff, and the cutoff was free to move. OK, good. So this was a nice result. Um, suggests that it's millisecond pulsars. Still, it's a quite indirect result. One can think about lots of caveats. First, other sources. I, I think one can go through the other source list, and it's pretty unlikely that any of them matters. What matters, however, might s simply because either sources are extragalactic, and then they don't just accumulate around the inner galaxy, or the sources are galactic, and then they're usually in the disk. So that's the main reason. Um, and then there are millisecond pulsars, but they are millisecond pulsars, so this would be what we want to, to, to look for. Uh, gas fluctuations are maybe a concern if one does this wavelet analysis, then also gas has substructure and could contribute, but we tried this, and in principle it contribute quite, could, quite con could contribute quite a lot, but we can just mask at least the known regions that are problematic, and this doesn't seem to affect the results. Still, this is no proof, obviously. Um, how much time do I have? Yeah, but I have ah, so a lot have of stuff. Too, too much, even. Uh, so it should go to what? 12. Sorry. No. 11.20. Okay, 11.20. 11.20, so you have like 15 minutes. Yeah, okay. If five minutes more, it's not. Oh. Yeah, so I, I wanted to, to talk, so I will then talk about two things. One, our attempt to make galactic TV's emission modeling a bit better. Uh, by j basically introducing hundreds of thousands of additional parameters. And another is how to test this pulsar hypothesis uh, in the near future, which is probably, yeah, which would be pretty useful. Good, so the fun thing with these galactic diffuse emission models is that you, if, if you look actually at like goodness of fit, or p uh, then, then it's ridiculously bad. So if you calculate the p-value, I did this once, you typically get something around 10 to minus 300 or something, because the models just don't fit the data. So they, they just don't fit. And there are many excesses along the galactic disk. Uh, so we pointed this out in 2014. 
many other people pointed this out as well. The, f the interesting thing is the excesses have a different spectrum. So the, the thing at the galactic center is peculiar, but still you might worry about, okay, there are lots of excesses. And then the usual way uncertainties are bracketed is by just having a bunch of benchmark models and seeing then what, what are the results. But usually this is what happens. You have model parameters, you have tiny statistical error bars, you have different benchmark models, and this all doesn't agree. Maybe the real model is over here and has a much larger error bar. So obviously what one needs to do is to massively increase the number of parameters in some smart way that is not completely arbitrary. And this is what, what we tried with, with a new analysis tool that we called SkyFact for sky factorization with adaptive constraint templates. And that's basically what it's done. So it starts with templates, which can adapt to the data. So they have some nuisance parameters, which are constraints. So it's like a penalized likelihood function. Um, and it's, it's a factorization ansatz in the same sense that we start with templates and then we assume that the nuisance parameters, are, that there are spatial nuisance parameters and spectral nuisance parameters. Um, and th this is basically how it works. So this would be the, the flux that we see in each pixel. This is the prediction, the, the, the spatial prediction of the flux. So this might be a sky map. This here would be the spectrum predicted for this component by Guyprop or whatever code. And these are nuisance parameters that can modify the, the template, the spatial template or the spectrum. And this is all overall normalization. And these factors here are usually around 1, so 1.1, 1 0.9. So they introduce tiny variations of the individual components at the 10, 20, 30% level or sometimes more. And then the likelihood that is fit is the Poisson likelihood that compares data with the model plus the part that includes penalization terms. So this, yeah, I don't go into details, but basically the, these ensure that the, uh, that the nuisance parameters cannot be arbitrarily far away from one. And there's also some smoothing going on to, to avoid that all the Poisson noise is just absorbed into the nuisance parameters. And typically this model for the analysis that we made up to now has 10 to the five parameters. So. But, but the, uh, one can show that this thing is a convex problem and then one can code up gradient descent and it works. So, and yeah, just to quickly go through this. So what we did recently was to uh, analyze again the galactic disk. So this galactic disk, galactic center here with various components. These are just some of them. So Marius gas rings, this would be inner part of the galaxy. This would be the one, the gas ring that contains us. Plus one inverse Compton template that looks like this. And if one does it fit to the data with a regular template fit, these are the residuals that you get at one GeV. If one switches on the template uncertainties, usually at the 10 to 30% level for inverse Compton, they were somewhat larger, uh, then the residuals look like this. So these are suddenly just residuals at the still one sigma. No, what was this? This is yeah at the, at the few sigma level, but this year were much stronger residuals, obviously. And this is uh, when the GV access is included. And you don't really see the difference here. So here's a tiny residual. Here's the residual. Um, here, here the residual is kind of weaker. And if one now compares this with uh, 6 GEV, it looks basically the same. But what you see first is that at 6 GEV, the, um, the excesses become somewhat stronger. So there are along the galactic disk some hard components that, that we don't model. Uh, but the one thing that you see is that the, the GV access actually does exactly the opposite. So if you go to higher energies, it becomes blue, which means before you were under-subtracting, afterwards you were over-subtracting. And this doesn't happen for anything else really in the sky. So th this is what is peculiar about the GV access. And it basically means that this thing here is has a harder spectrum, at least at lower energy, so around 1 GeV than most of the other things that you see in the galactic disk. Whereas this year are probably extended, uh, extended emission around uh, sources that you also see in HES. Where is the GeV? Yeah, right, that's like the left, and you can't barely see it. <laughs> but it, it, it's basically this, this thing here. So here it's red. If, you, if I go to higher energies, it turns blue. Whereas all the other, I mean, you have brighter residuals in the disk, but they are red and just turn more red. Wh what this means if you translate this in spectrum is simply that these excesses here have a relatively 
a hard spectrum, um, whereas the spectrum from this thing here uh, is, is going down faster. So I can show it like maybe here. So most of the excesses would have a spectrum like this. The GeV excess would have a spectrum like this. And we are looking at this and this energy roughly. So this, this is why it looks slightly different here. If, if I would have had a slide below 1 GeV, then we would have seen the, the opposite effect again. So it doesn't look very significant here. But I'm, I'm not advocating that the GeV axis is not significant or not there. I'm mostly advocating that often residual maps are not very helpful to, um, to, to find anything or to, to so show anything. So how should it be in this map? I, I cannot see it. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, I mean, it, it's tiny here. But the idea is that the entire thing is extended at least up to like 10 degrees. Oh, of course, but, but the yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, there are other analyses where it's much more prominent. It depends a lot on how you do it. One way to make it very prominent is a paper by John Huang. If you just do a spectral decomposition of the sky uh, and, and fit like a BB bar spectrum, or MS, in that case, they used BB bar, and a bunch of other more like extended power laws, then you get a pretty significant excess here in the center. Um, so. Anyway, so the, the, okay, then this, this is just to show that our resid. So this is are the spatial modulation parameters for the outer gas ring. They simply absorb all the dark gas. There's something called dark gas, which is not traced by a 21 centimeter line or the CO line. Uh, we didn't include these corrections in our analysis. They just came automatically because our rescaling factors could account for this. Uh, in the Galprop papers, they usually include this, but that doesn't make a difference for us. Um, for the Fermi bubbles, what we could find is that there, and this is what other people found before, but um, for, for us it was a bit cleaner. So instead of masking point sources, we also just fit all the point sources. So we, we found that, yeah, we have the Fermi bubbles here in this region, but then also some extra component that has a Fermi bubble that has a very hard spectrum that is not part of what, what I would call GEV excess but um, that seems to be there in the galactic center. And probably it's related to star formation activity, but, but that's like future work. So what we tried to do in a recent analysis was actually to just compare different models for the GV access. So this is the data. This is what be in a contracted NFW profile for a dark matter signal. And this here are just templates for how stellar mass is distributed in the galactic disk. So you know that the Milky Way actually has a bar. So this is how this bar-like object would look if you if you if it would emit gamma rays so it's it's like slightly extended and a bit thicker here and a bit box shaped and then there is a nuclear bulge so this is a disk plus some stellar very dense component and then we also try to x shape thing because this was proposed in pre other studies that this could actually ex expand the gv axis we do the analysis and basically this is what you find so this is these are all components in our fit, and the red one is, th is what is absorbed uh, by the red cluster, uh, red clump giants. And this, this yellow one is absorbed by the nuclear bulge. So you can see, at least for the red cluster giants, that they have clearly this typical GV access spectrum that peaks here around a couple of GV and then it drops down. And okay, what's interesting, what we found is that now if one compares the emission from these components from the nuclear bulge, and from the boxy bulge, the gamma ray emission absorbed by, by the GEV access or in the GEV access with their actual stellar mass, then this is just a linear relation. So this suggests, uh, so one th yeah, suggests that there is a connection between uh, the distribution of stars in the galactic bulge and the GEV access. I mean, this could have looked very different, but it didn't. Um, it's in retrospect not really a, a big surprise because if you overlay this with this, then on average, if you just do a, do a like average around um, different angles, looks pretty much like a contracted NFW profile. Uh, but still, we also found that this combination here fits the data much better by 10 sigma or something than, than this shape. So this was, was a nice result. Still, that doesn't prove the GEV access is necessarily millisecond pulsars or related to the bar. But what one needs is to actually find the millisecond pulsars. And so 
The situation there up to now still is that most millisecond pulsars that are found are found close to us. So this is where we are, and there's a kiloparsec, or, and most of the millisecond pulsars that are found are found close to us here. Yeah. The reason is simply that it's not so easy to find them. So traditionally, you just found them. Okay. One, one way to find them is to look at distant globular clusters, for, for instance, and then you look for a very long time with a radio telescope. Um, this you can afford because you know where, where to look, right? So the problem with radio telescopes compared to Fermi is that they have a usually tiny field of view. So you, you have to know where you want to look. And then you can find distant ones like this one here, which is not at the galactic center. It's above or below or something. Um, then the usual other way was just surveys where you can't go that deep, so you find only close ones. Or what was very promising is to look at gamma ray unidentified sources. So Fermi sources found by, by Fermi satellite in gamma rays. You, you don't see their pulsation because you see a couple of photons per day or something like this, but they pulsate every millisecond. So uh, to find pulsation in the gamma rays, you first have to find the radio pulsar in radio, millisecond pulsar in radio. Then you can, can measure the ephemeritis, so the, the frequency basically, fold this back into gamma ray data, and then confirm that also the gamma rays are pulsating, pulsating with the same frequency. And this, again, only works for sources that are nearby, because first you have to see them in gamma rays, then you have to see the radio counterpart, and then you need enough statistics to see the pulsation in gamma rays again. So this is why you typically see only closed ones. But it's n you wouldn't be surprised if there are millisecond pulsars everywhere, right? If, if they are here. So what we did to estimate now the... So the trick is now to estimate what this GV axis would look like in radio, right? And the, the problem is tricky because what we see in gamma rays is just the diffuse emission of if there are millisecond pulsars, all millisecond pulsars at once. Um, whereas what we are interested in is the radio luminosity function of individual millisecond pulsars in the bulge, right, and, and the normalization. And this, this is made complicated by the fact that depending on the angle at which you look at the millisecond pulsars, you either see lots of emission or not. And also the emission angle of gamma rays and radio emission is not the same. So for some, you might only see the gamma ray emission or the radio emission. So you can't do this on a, easily on a source-by-source -source basis. And you can't do this easily by just modeling the entire population from first principles. But what we did, what works, is uh, to, to use globular clusters as proxies. So globular clusters, as I said, have, have lots of millisecond pulsars in them. They are just observed in radio. And they shine in gamma rays. And the gamma ray emission is most likely completely dominated by the millisecond pulsars. So basically, it's like a mini galactic center excess. Right? So you have the combined gamma ray emission and you have the radio luminosity function that you see from the in, get from the individual sources. So what we used is a bunch of globular clusters, six, to estimate the, stuck the combined gamma ray emission that uh, we would, would get per, uh, per radio bright millisecond pulsar. And where radio bright means it has a luminosity of 10 microyansky at the distance of the galactic center. This is some radio astronomy units, so I don't, but, but it's not very bright. This is actually, we call it radio bright, but it's, it's already on the hard to detect side. Anyway, so in this way, one, one gets that per radio bright millisecond pulsar, one should see around 10 to the 34 ergs per second. And then one can just rescale this to the 10, 10 to the 30, roughly 10 to the 37 ergs per second. And, and we got that there should be around 3000 radio bright millisecond pulsars and probably there are tens of thousands because most of them or many of them will actually not point towards us. But anyway, so in this way one can get a relatively reasonable prediction for the amount of radio bright millisecond pulsars. There are caveats to this. There's, may maybe there's a difference between the millisecond pulsars and the global clusters and the one in the, uh, in the bulge. Anyway, that's the number. Spatial distribution one can just infer from the GV axis. And then one can put this together. So this is a model for millisecond pulses for the galactic disk seen from the top. This here would be all the millisecond pulses in the disk, just extrapolated from the ones close to us. And then there is this huge gray dot, which are the tens, the, the many, many millisecond pulses, uh, the 3,000 in our case, uh, that would sit just in the galactic center region, in the galactic bulge. And what one can then do is to do a careful sensitivity calculation for a radio using the radio radiometer equation, 
there are lots of effects that play a role. In particular, if you look through the galactic disk, you look through lots of ionized material, which distorts the pulsation. So you, you basically you get temporary smearing due to scattering on the ionized interstellar medium. So you can't very well look for millisecond pulsars in the disk, but and you shouldn't look for millisecond pulsars 10 20 degrees away because there's no GV access there. There's somewhere a sweet spot which we identified to be roughly here, so like two, three degrees away, above and below the galactic center. And the good news is that future radio telescopes should be able to see this. So this is the entire bulge population that we modeled. This is the best upper limit from, from the Parkes High Time Resolution Universe uh, survey. And the dots here show uh, what GBT should see. So the Green Bank Telescope, the problem with Green Bank Telescope, we tried several times to get time on Green Bank Telescope. The problem is that uh, you can't do a survey with this thing because again, the field of view is pretty small. So one already needs to know where to look and one needs to know, well, ba basically the strategy there would have been to look at bright, re reasonably bright gamma ray sources in the inner galaxy. They can't be too bright because then they couldn't be possibly part of the bulge population. Um, and then the problem, yeah, there are various problems with this. So it boils down to if you, if you have like 100 hours on GBT, you maybe find three. And they didn't find this very convincing. So anyway, so the, the good thing with Mercat is that Mercat can actually do surveys. So this is an interferometer. Instead of one beam, you have like 400. So you can actually go through a large region of the sky and just do a blind survey. Um, and it turns out that with 100 hours of Mercat time, one should maybe see 10 or so, so th uh, this was like, if you get 300 hours, we should see thir 30. And yeah, so we worked together with them to make this happen, hopefully in 2019 or something. The telescope is now getting commissioned and up and running. It's, it's in South Africa, one of the precursor instruments for uh, SKA. And yeah, hopefully there will be a search next year, we will see. And the nice thing with millisecond pulses is that one can use this dispersion measure, so the f effect that, that the radio emission is, is affected by the um, free electrons along the line of sight. One can use, which, and, and it distorts or basically delays in frequency dependent fashion the pulsation. One can use this to estimate the distance. And so one should see around 10 maybe within 100 hours of observation time from the bulge, then probably also 10 or 20 along the line of sight. But you can actually make then a histogram in principle at least, where you should see that there are a bunch of them really just peaking at the distance of the galactic center. And this would be pretty strong indication that there is that, that the GV axis is from millisecond pulsars. Then to prove that 100% of the GV access is caused by this and it's not like 50% and then 50% a dark matter signal will be super hard. But I mean, this would be So how, how big, um, how in, in degrees, or I don't know whatever, how what fraction of the uh, of the galactic center, can this uh, meerkat uh, array uh, observe at the time? How, how large is the field of view? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't With have to to the galactic center, <coughs> is comparable or is it still much smaller and they have to... Maybe I still have... Usually, usually it's very, very small, right? The, the, the yeah, I deleted the... Okay, I don't have the slides here. The Okay, fine. Uh, let me just go back. Yeah, I don't remember the numbers. Um, well, yeah, I can check it later. Uh, the, the point is the field of view is about 400 times bigger than for Meerkat in some sense. Um, so you can, in principle, do uh, the survey just 400 times faster. So that, that helps a lot. Uh, but I think for each of these, these are one by or two by two degree patches, you still need a couple of pointings. So I think with, yeah, I, I don't remember, probably you need 10 hours per two Is by two region. Is this a priority of the, of the will they, will they dedicate the time? So the, the radio, pul so TRAPUM is the um, radio pulsar group, and they are pretty much interested in this definitely, because it would be a pretty cool discovery. And it's like in their hands somehow, right? So, <laughs> I mean, they, they are the first instrument that, is, that should be able to actually do a significant progress there. So we are, together with Francesca Calora, actually we, we, we try to make this happen. We, we joined them and 
yeah, the, the only challenge will be, or one of the challenges will be to get observation time. So this is not part of the key science goals, but this will have to go through the open calls. But since the entire Pulsar group is behind this, it's I guess likely that we will get the time. Then initially we tried to sneak in 300 hours of, of survey in their key science goals, which kind of didn't work. <laughs> this would have been nice. But uh, so now since it's an open time proposal, we probably have to just take 100 hours. And then the problem is a bit if the expectation value is 10, and the uncertainty of this expectation is probably still a factor of two, at least. Then maybe you find, like, then maybe in truth, truth it's five, and maybe you find two. <laughs> and then what do you say? So I, I think the goal is to find at least one or two in this first attempt, and then get more time. Uh, may, maybe we are lucky and we find immediately 10 or something. But uh, as I said, the nice thing is you can actually say something about the distance. If, if one finds zero at this distance, it, one has to see what this actually means, because then you could still argue that maybe the bulge population is just not as bright as the as the GBT uh, as the global cluster population. But if, if one starts finding something, this will be good. But okay, even then with SKA, we are down here, so they should find lots of them. But then one just has to make wait a bit longer. I, I guess my time is up now. I, I, I think so. Yes. Uh, sh should we then ask for thank you? Okay. Do we have time for, for some questions? One or two questions? Mm -hmm. So the uh, dwarfs for oibles, you don't see any great gamma rays from them? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure whether everybody would agree, because there were at least some discussions about gamma ray emission from reticulum 2, which is one of the dwarf swirls where I don't know if the situation has changed, but the J value, I think, was not very well known. But it, the position was known, and there were analysis about the gamma emission. There was weak indications for, actually, gamma emission from the source, okay. uh, but at the few sigma okay. level. So the gamma ray excess in, the, in, in this galaxy turns out to be from dark matter. The question is going to be why... <coughs> Can you repeat the question? Why, why are these dark matter dominated dwarfs for oils? Why don't they show it? Like, if it, if it turns out to be dark matter in the galaxy. Um, it, yeah, so independently of reticulum 2, uh, if, this, if the galactic center ex excess turns out to be dark matter, I mean, the, the only way really to prove it would be to find emission from dwarf hurdles, for instance. Given that there is no, no even in interesting hint from them, except for reticulum 2, but I mean, the, the others basically just give you limits. Even with more data, I mean, Fermi could measure now twice as long, but the mission time is already almost over the official one, so it depends a bit on what's going on. But still, this just gives a factor of two in, in, in the data, so this will not make a huge difference if there is nothing already now. So with Fermi alone, this might be hard. What's fun is that antiprotons, which could have completely killed this thing, just don't do it, <laughs> because <laughs> you get this, like, Huperonophilic uh, philic, uh, line. I mean, you, you, you basically, uh, uh, yeah, it's a bit hard. But let me sh just show the slides again. I mean, you, you get basically, in all analysis I have seen, uh, using uh, using AMS data, you get this funny shape for, where is, okay, where is this? <coughs> yeah, this thing here. I mean, you get always this thing. Oh. You don't get anything, you just get my files. Good, so you get, yes, yeah. So understanding this a bit better in the future would be interesting. I mean, if, if this is robust, then this would be an indication for a dark matter signal. I just find it hard to believe that one can really understand this here. That's a sufficient level. A follow-up question is, like, because these millisecond are so hard to see, how do you know that in the dwarf spheroidals there's not a ton of these millisecond pulsars so that they're actually not dark matter dominated at all? Ah, no, but they're definitely new. I mean, the. the Again, yeah, okay, the, the question, if I understand correctly, is why. No, I, I actually. So, do I understand correctly that you're asking whether maybe not millisecond pulsars are dominating the mass of dwarfs? That, yes. That's. I mean, for sure you would see this pretty bright in the gamma ray sky. I haven't, I, it's not easy to estimate now in my head, but I would expect that they would just be bright sources of gamma ray emission that peaks at 2 GeV. But they're so dim, we can only see a 
Yeah, yeah, but if you have like a 10 to the 10 to the 9 of them, then that, that will be pretty bright. Yeah. Because what's the average mass of the workflow? They're pretty massive. 10 to 9, 10 to 10. And so millisecond and parser would be around 10 mm -hmm. solar mass. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be a pretty bright source. Uh, any other question? Well, so we're sort of more questions for later. And so thank you very much. Thanks.